Hey Starship fans, my name is Zach Golden and welcome to the first ever CSI Starbase YouTube video. If you guys follow me on Twitter, you know that I like to post deep dive explanations about various Starship related topics and today is no exception. By now, I'm sure most of you have heard about some damage that occurred to Booster 7 during a cryo test last week and uh, it's looking pretty serious. I'm sure a lot of you have been wondering, how did something like this happen? Well, we have a little bit more information that we're able to share with you today thanks to some careful investigations looking through the actual cryo test footage. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about some other important updates to Starship and other Starship related topics. First, we're going to talk about some updates out of the Kennedy Space Center complex thanks to this tweet right here. This actually showed up on my Twitter feed earlier in the week and I was very excited when I saw it. Let's get into it a little bit more, shall we? This is the first sighting of anything related to the base structure of the Starship Orbital Launch Mount for the Pad 39A facility that we have seen up until now. It was spotted on the highway as it was entering the Kennedy Space Center complex last week. I retweeted this and in the comments there were a lot of doubts as to whether or not this is actually for the Starship Launch Mount given a few noticeable differences from the first OLM constructed at Starbase. In this throwback image from RGV Aerial, we can see what the equivalent cylindrical support columns looked like as they were being sleeved over the rebar cages. At this time, half of them were still on the ground waiting to be installed, which made it easier for us to determine that these cylinders are roughly 40 feet long, using the adjacent vehicles for scale, or about the length of a standard shipping container. Comparing what we saw on this flatbed truck to the existing OLM legs, one of the first major differences I have noticed is in the thickness of the material which appears to be a much thinner gauge of steel. This is something that we have been expecting for a while, thanks to the first everyday astronaut tour of Starbase when Sam Patel mentioned the need to reduce the amount of welding required when assembling this structure. Thanks to RGV ground drill, we can see that the existing OLM has wedge-shaped plates attached to each column facing towards the center of the pad. You may already know that these function as a flame diverter, but it's important to note that they're made of three separate wedge-shaped pieces. The seam from where they are welded together is clearly visible even though it's been painted over. If you subtract away the portions that are highlighted here in red, what you're left with is a column that looks nearly identical to the one we see being delivered to the Kennedy Space Center complex. The upgraded wedge shape is also significantly larger and covers the entire diameter of the column. This is something I was expecting to see on the first OLM. I say this because I'm assuming it would significantly reduce the amount of turbulence as the exhaust exits from underneath the platform. While this might seem like a minor change, in my opinion, this is a great example of an improved design and manufacturing process for which SpaceX is famous for. While constructing the new orbital launch mount at the Pad 39A complex, it is much more important for SpaceX to reduce the amount of work that has to be done at the launch site as much as possible. Because of this, I am actually surprised that the upper portions of the flame diverter have not been pre-installed as well. This is one of the only reasons I'm not completely positive that these are what we think they are. It is possible that they plan to include them in the initial fabrication process, but chose to skip that step in order to get them out the door as quickly as possible. After all, most of us have been expecting the orbital launch mount to be one of the first things to rise out of the ground at the new launch site. So in my opinion, these things are kind of late. With that out of the way, let's move over to Starbase and see what's happening at the orbital launch complex this week. In this image taken last year by Starship Gazer, we can see what the cryo tubes inside the orbital launch integration tower looked like when they were first installed. And this is what they look like now. This is a pretty significant change, so I think it's worth taking a deeper look at. Shortly after the testing campaign of Stage Zero began, I noticed an interesting looking cryotube manifold appear near one of the ground fabrication buildings at Starbase. My first impression was that this was most likely destined for either the orbital tank farm or the OLIT, which was confusing because at the time, both structures were thought to be completed as far as mechanical pipe work goes. After the conclusion of the first full stack cryo test, I finally received my answer as I watched this manifold get installed into the tower during a Lab Padre livestream. Until this point, I hadn't realized that this section of cryo tubing for the lock supply had been removed, so this was a very interesting revelation. This assembly appears to split the flow into two different paths and then recombine them, which made absolutely no sense to me at the time. A few days later, two very large objects were also lifted into the tower. It was a painfully slow process as the pieces had to be transferred from the crane hook to a set of chain hoists attached to the piping structure above and then yet again to another set of chain hoists deeper inside the building. Thanks to a few CSI Starbase researchers, we were able to positively identify these as basket strainers. A basket strainer is a component used to filter out foreign objects and debris, preventing them from entering the Starship and thereafter the intricate pipework of the six Raptor engines, which, depending on what the composition of the debris is, could cause serious damage possibly resulting in the explosion of the engine. 
A few days after this, RGV Aerial performed a flyover of the facility. Thanks to these amazing photos, I was able to notice a second, smaller manifold on the ground outside of the tower waiting to be installed. This one actually had both basket strainers attached already. The very next day, Chief from the WAI Plus channel caught it being hoisted into the air after the existing section had been removed the night before. So these strainers are now on both the locks and the CH4 cryo tubes. The split flow design allows for one of them to function as a primary, while the other is a backup. This way, you always have one working filter at all times. Having this kind of redundancy leaves me to believe that this is a very important piece of equipment. The fact that this important piece of equipment wasn't included in the initial installation process also leads me to speculate that Ship 20 likely could have ingested a decent amount of when it was tested for the first time on top of Booster 4. This could be a contributing factor to the decision not to use this ship during the first orbital launch flight, but for now, until we get an official explanation from Elon, there's no way for us to know for certain. A few weeks ago, Booster 7 completed its first cryo test on the orbital launch mount. Shortly after, it was moved over to what is known as the Can Crusher for additional structural testing. The purpose of this structure is to simulate the dynamic forces that the center 13 engines exert on the thrust puck during the various stages of a launch. This was the first time we had seen this kind of test on a booster, so I was hoping that we would be able to see some physical signs of the hydraulic rams in action. A few CSI Starbase field agents were actually able to find the moment we were looking for. Looking closer at this shot from Lab Padre, you can actually see the ice start to fall off the vehicle as dynamic forces are applied to the bottom of it. The ice appears to fall off the side of the tank in waves, which makes it look similar to a human heartbeat. We figured that we might be able to see this rhythmic pulse in the audio waveform, so we put it all together and this is what it looks like. You can actually see changes in the peaks of the waves every time the ice falls off of the vehicle. Overall, it appeared to us that the test was a success until the next day when I received a notification that SpaceX workers were performing a Booster 7 COVID test on Starship Gazer's livestream. As soon as I tuned into the stream, I witnessed a massive PVC pipe being shoved into the lower access hatch of the booster liquid oxygen tank. It quickly became apparent that they were also trying to reach into a secondary structure inside of the vehicle. After making this observation, we speculated that they were more than likely trying to angle this pipe into the header tank, which is located at the bottom of the LOX tank. This was pretty concerning considering we had never seen this procedure performed before. Thanks to Chief from the What About It team, we can see what these header tanks actually look like. Looking at the tank again from the outside, we can see that there is indeed an access hatch on the side of the header tank, so this is most likely what the crews were aiming for with the long pole. In this amazing shot by Nick and Sweeney, we can see Booster 8's header tank installed in the aft section as it was moved through the production site. When we crop out the tank from the previous image and rescale it over the first, we can get an idea of where this secondary hatch is located with respect to the first. This secondary access hatch is slightly lower than the first, which explains why a second group of workers was needed in order to help bend the pole into position. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a third group of workers inside of the tank at the time helping to angle it down into the secondary hole. Figuring out what they might be looking at was actually pretty easy because there's really only one thing inside of this tank. Thanks to this diagram by Sam SN18, you can see that the only thing inside of this tank is the methane downcomer which transfers fuel from the upper tank down to the 33 Raptor engines. Returning to the previous video from Starship Gazer, we can see the fiber optic camera carefully being worked into position by one of the crew members on the blue man basket. Directly behind him, the camera operator appears to be inspecting the footage from inside of the tank. It took a while for him to get the camera into the right position where he was actually able to see something that stood out to him. Once he finds what he's looking for, he begins to explain what he's seeing to his buddies on the other work platform. You can see him hold his hands up in a V-shape to describe what he's seeing. I had a feeling that seeing this worker describe what he was observing using that V-shape was probably not a good sign. It kind of looked like he wanted to be absolutely sure of what he was seeing before he reported back his findings. It was about this time that I started thinking that maybe we might have a problem here. If you guys follow me on Twitter, you know that I have a pretty hard time keeping my speculation myself. So shortly after this video concluded, I posted a tweet asking, do you guys think Booster 7 will be scrapped? Some may right here. With a little over 1400 responses, I was really surprised with the results. Close to 49% of people said yes, which was really interesting considering at the time there wasn't really much evidence to support this. This is one of the rare times where I continue to speculate on something even when I really don't have any evidence. The reason for that is because of this moment right here. The look on this worker's face when he finally comes to terms with what he's seeing reminds me of one of those moments where something is so bad that you really can't help but to laugh about it. Needless to say, after what we had just witnessed, it was all hands on deck at CSI Starbase headquarters as we monitored social media for any possible explanation that could explain this random cavity search. 
It wasn't long before rumors of a collapsed downcomer began to surface on social media. We weren't really able to verify the validity of this information, but we began to search for evidence of it anyways. We decided to review footage from the second cryo test to see if we could find any signs of the malarkey. Now, before we review this footage, I want to warn you, some people in this audience may find what we're about to show you very disturbing. The first place we decided to look was during the main part of the cryo test. There wasn't really anything that stood out to us because we figured that if there was a collapse of the downcomer while there was fluid in the methane tank, we would have quickly seen it all drain down to the LOX tank, so it's safe to say it probably didn't occur here. The next most likely place where we might see a failure is during the detank process. This is because if you drain the liquid too quickly out of the upper tank, it could cause the pressure inside of the downcomer to drop pretty significantly. If the differential pressure between the inside of the header tank and the downcomer is too great, it could cause it to collapse or implode inward. We can easily identify that the detank process has started due to the heavy venting coming out of the cryo shells on the left. This typically only occurs when liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen are being drained back to the GSE tanks. The pressure is vented out of the stacks on the front of the tanks in order to balance the internal pressure. As both tanks start to empty themselves, you can see the frost line on the LOX tank stop right about where we would expect the top of the header tank to be. This is the part of the test where things start to get exciting. You can see here that a massive depressurization of both the methane and the LOX tank have started. The LOX tank actually frosts up extremely quick. Honestly, when I first saw this, I thought this might be a sign of where this damage could have actually occurred. As a commentator for the Lab Padre channel, I have covered many Starship and Booster testing events. I honestly can't recall a time where the LOX tank froze up this completely during a depressurization. To me, this looked like a change in procedure, so I decided to compare two different depress events to see if I could notice anything major. With that being said, I'm going to let you guys hear both of them for yourself, so you can decide if you think there's a difference between these two tests before I explain what I noticed. In this first clip, we can see a depress event that occurred about halfway through the test. Now that you guys have been able to hear the first one, let's take a look at the final depress at the end of the test. In my opinion, this sounds a lot different from the first one. It almost sounds like there's a little bit of a gurgling sound coming out of the CH4 tank, almost as if there's a lot less pressure up there than there normally would be. Without having access to any sensor data, making this observation based on sound alone was going to be pretty hard to convince people of. I was trying to work up a better way of explaining this when I noticed something that I previously missed the first time around when I watched this. Let's take a look again at this point in the depress when the LOX tank had fully frosted over again. The first thing you'll notice here is the small vent coming off the top of the CH4 tank. What happens next pretty much speaks for itself in my opinion. Wow, I'm gonna have to go ahead and say I think we found the moment that this downcomer collapsed. So with that, I'm gonna let you guys review the footage a few more times, and then let me know in the comments what you guys think. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that footage. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty excited when I found that. Yet, somehow I was sad all at the same time. Anyways, before I post this video, I figured I would check in with the Twitterverse to see what their opinions about whether or not this downcomer failed instantaneously or if it was more of a slow progression. You can see the results for yourself here on the screen. It seems like the majority of you were thinking the same thing. Just so you guys know, I typically post polls like this to give hints about things that I plan to cover. So now that you know this, I highly recommend you follow me on Twitter so that you can have the opportunity to be extremely confused every time I post one of these as well. While you're at it, make sure to hit subscribe on this video. As I mentioned, this is my first ever YouTube video and I plan to put them out regularly. With that being said, this is the most likely place that you're going to find the results for future CSI Starbase investigations. So getting back into it, 
After inspection of the downcomer was completed at the launch complex, Booster 7 was moved back to the high bay where it was attached to the bridge crane for support while scaffolding was set up inside the LOX tank. You can see here in this footage from Starship Gazer that these guys were getting ready for a pretty serious procedure. Inside of the header tank, crews were working like crazy cutting out the downcomer piece by piece while these curved panels were being offloaded at the hastily made loading dock. It's pretty clear now that SpaceX planned to repair this downcomer instead of scrapping the entire vehicle and moving on to Booster 8. This has caused progress on Ship 24 and Booster 8 to largely grind to a halt as Booster 7's aft section is being repaired. The only way that this process wouldn't cause a delay to those vehicles is if SpaceX were somehow able to start using the two bridge cranes in the wide bay soon. By the way, what's going on with that? I think now is as good a time as any to check in with the progress of the wide bay construction. We can see that the two bridge cranes have been installed. This is not really new news, but we know that they're both active, so really there must be something else that's preventing these things from being able to be put into use right now. Moving up, you can see that the floor panels for the rooftop bar or possible mission control room are about two thirds of the way installed at the time of this photo from RGB Ground Room. Looking at the right side, we can see that another plate has been attached at the exposed edge of the floor, which is what we were expecting given that there is most likely going to be a concrete floor poured at some point in the near future. Speaking of concrete, during our most recent RGV aerial live stream, I noticed some pretty heavy duty rebar near the entrance of the wide bay. The next day, RGV the ground drill was able to get another view of them from the ground. You can see that these are some exceptionally thick pieces of rebar. To understand why this is good news, we have to look back at how the base of the wide bay was constructed. In this time lapse, you can see that the areas where the perimeter walls would be, the concrete was partially broken out, leaving a rectangle in the middle of the building. Over the next few weeks, crews worked around the clock, forming out the floating base structure and pouring concrete in stages. It's important to note that during this process, the concrete in the center of the building was never touched. There is about a two to three foot drop off when you reach the bay floor. Gravel was added on top of the concrete to allow the LR11000 super crane to crawl into the middle of the structure. So now that the danger of overhead debris falling is largely non-existent anymore, I was expecting that the floor of this building would be completely torn out and replaced with a significantly thicker concrete base to better support the weight of however many boosters SpaceX plans to put in there at any given time. Luckily, Jessica Kirst was on site the very next day and was able to catch the concrete parade as it was happening. You can see here that the truck after truck of concrete made its way to the wide bit. This went on for a majority of the day. Once the floor of this building had finished curing, I wouldn't be surprised if we see Booster 7 or 8 move into there very soon after. Well, that's all we have time for today. So if you guys enjoyed this content and want to see more, please make sure to like and subscribe. And also let me know how you guys feel about it in the comments. This is my first ever YouTube video, so go a little bit easy on me. Before I go, if you guys want to hear even more updates about what's happening at Starbase, make sure you tune into the RGV Aerial live stream review where we will be going over the most recent flyover images, and there's actually a lot of changes this week at Starbase, so don't miss out on that. See you guys next week. Bye.